Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Neo with the Our Voice Podcast. I could not be more excited for today's conversation. Uh, I, we're talking to a couple heroes of mine, uh, people who have really made a difference in folks' lives. And so we're just going to jump right in. I, I'm going to ask uh, Lenore and Aswa to introduce themselves. We're here to talk about things that impact people who are directly impacted by the system, because uh, that's that's what we do here at Our Voice. Right? This is a platform in which we can talk about our real life experiences and how they impact public policy, how they impact our culture, all that kind of stuff. So I'm really excited. I'm just going to turn it over to you, Lenore, if I could, then you as well, and maybe do a quick introduction. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what you do, and then we can jump in the conversation. Neil, it's great to be here with you. I'm Lenore Anderson. I'm the uh, president and co-founder of an organization called Alliance for Safety and Justice, and we advance uh, safety uh, policy reform in the large states in the country. We work in eight states and um, one of them we are proud to work in is Florida. And uh, we've been long-term partners with uh, uh, FRRC, including on the Yes on Amendment 4 campaign, which is where you and I, Neil, got a chance to uh, work closely uh, for that uh, couple of year period. And it was one of those life-changing experiences that I'm just so proud we, we got a chance to do. It's, uh, it's great to have this conversation today. Awesome, thanks so much. How about you, Aswad? Hey, what's up, uh, Neil? Thanks for having uh, me on uh, today. So I'm Aswad Thomas. I'm the Vice President at the Alliance for Safety and Justice. Also serve as the National Director of one of our flagship programs, which is Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice, which is a national network of over 180,000 uh, crime survivors uh, coming together to, you know, to share our stories, uh, to heal together, and to advocate for a justice system that prioritizes healing, uh, prevention, recovery, over more spending on in incarceration. And so just like our work is embedded uh, in Florida, uh, where we have over 11,000 members of Crime Survivor Safety and Justice uh, in Florida. So I'm excited to talk about the work that our members have been doing uh, the past few years in Florida and also across the country as well. Oh man, I'm excited to to talk about the work as well. Really excited to talk about your 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 book, Lenore. Uh, but I wonder if maybe we we can start with uh, with your story as well. I, I remember first meeting you in 2017, and really just seeing narratives that I had in my own head about how the system worked just kind of fall by the wayside as you shared your story. And I was wondering if maybe you can just kind of take a couple minutes or take some time and and, and educate folks uh, who are listening and watching on, on 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 why you do the work and 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 kind of what brought you here. Of course, you know, my journey uh, has definitely been a long journey uh, to get to this point. Um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm the youngest of five boys. I grew up in Hartford, Connecticut, and spent most of my uh, childhood living in Detroit, Michigan. Um, for me, as the uh, the youngest son of five boys, uh, growing up in a single parent uh, household, and, and, and didn't have a lot of uh, opportunities in my neighborhood for young black men to succeed. Um, you know, as the youngest son at a very young age, I was a very good basketball uh, player. Um, I, I knew that, you know, uh, that my basketball talent would someday, uh, you know, help me get out of uh, the neighborhood. And that's an experience that I also shared uh, with my best friend, uh, Ruben Elder. Uh, similar to myself, Ruben was uh, uh, the youngest of uh, four boys uh, in his family. He lived right down the street from me. We both had dreams of going to college and playing uh, basketball uh, one day, um, but unfortunately, um, uh, in 1993, uh, my best friend Ruben Elder uh, was shot and killed in a drive uh, by shooting. Um, and I remember uh, when uh, Ruben lost uh, his life, um, the, just the, the impact that not only had on his family, the impact that it had on me, but the impact that it had on the entire uh, community um, as well. Um, but unfortunately, Ruben wasn't the only uh, friend that I lost to violence. You know, uh, throughout my life, I've lost over 40 friends uh, to gun violence, um, but I've never imagined of, of myself uh, becoming a, a victim of gun violence uh, one day. Um, but it happened, uh, something that I escaped for most of my life. Uh, you know, uh, those uh, those uh, bullets finally came knocking on my door. Um, so in 2009, I had just graduated uh, from college. I was the first male in my family to ever graduate. Uh, from college. I still remember that day uh, vividly uh, seeing my mother uh, in the audience, her, her big, bright uh, smile, just uh, so happy and so thrilled that her one of her boys uh, you know, graduated uh, college. So, And I also a star basketball player um, in Massachusetts at Elm uh, College. So for me, 2009 was that highest point. I just, just graduated from college. 
I was a star basketball player uh, on my way to play professional basketball uh, overseas. Um, but unfortunately, um, I became a, a victim of gun violence. Um, I was uh, shot twice in my back while leaving the corner store uh, in uh, my neighborhood. Uh, and that uh, incident uh, ended my professional uh, basketball career and nearly uh, my life um, as, as well. Man, like I'm, I'm hearing that, right? And I'm like, I'm thinking here you are, right? Top of your game, right? Living your dream. And you, you, you go to a, go to a store just like anybody. And all of a sudden, boom, everything changes, right? Yeah. And, you know, it was a, a night that I will uh, never forget. Um, and and the, the physical uh, uh, pain uh, was extraordinary. Um, but, you know, you know, being in the hospital and, and being told that I, you know, I suffered uh, these two gunshot wounds. I had a collapsed lung. I was suffering from internal uh, bleeding. My doctor spent a lot of time talking about the physical uh, challenge that I was going through, but nobody never prepared me for the, the psychological uh, challenge uh, of living with PTSD, uh, the flashbacks, uh, the nightmares, uh, the, the anger, the resentment, the depression, the stress. Um, and, and those are the things I was left to deal with on my own um, without any support uh, from uh, victim services, without any counseling, any therapy, and also no support from uh, law enforcement um, as well who came to visit me. And it was always about the case, uh, not about uh, my healing and the services that I needed uh, to recover from that incident. So you and your family have just gone through this traumatic situation, right? And 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 the interaction that you have with the community really is primarily around conversations with law enforcement, which are also stressful and but 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 not focused on healing, not focused on you know the the, the well being of the people who have been traumatized. Is, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. And I remember each time law enforcement came to visit me, you know, they never um, asked me how I was doing. Uh, they never told me about the victims compensation uh, program. So if you're listening out there, every state has a victims compensation uh, program that's meant to help uh, crime victims, you know, would help uh, burying a loved one with funeral and burial costs, helps to provide counseling and therapy, helps with housing uh, relocation support, helps with uh, lost wages uh, as you're navigating uh, being a victim of violent crime. Um, law enforcement, you know, never told me about uh, the victim compensation program they never even informed me that there was a victim advocate in their department who's supposed to work with victims uh like myself and so you know my family and i were left to deal with that incident um on our own um and that is the experience that so many crime victims across the country uh share of being a victim of a violent crime no support uh from the justice system no access to victim compensation or victim services and so we're left to deal uh, with these experiences uh, on our own. And, and and that's what kind of led me on this journey of, of finding out, you know, um, the, the failures of uh, the justice system, but also the failure of, you know, uh, you know, um, you know, policy uh, makers to help ensure that victims uh, in all crime victims get access to the services, resources they need to help. Well, well in, in, yeah, in, in your book, Lenore, you, you, you pick up this kind of the, the 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 story uh and, and the experiences of, of people like like you as who who uh have been victims of uh, of crime and and violence and the the role trauma plays in in a real in a person's life as they, as they walk through this can you kind of jump in here lenore and talk about how that 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 piece of the the conversation is is so vital if we really want to enact policies that are good for uh people who have been through this trauma Sure. So, you know, <clears throat> Aswa and I have talked a, a lot about um, what was going on in, in 2009. In 2009, the, the year that uh, he became a victim of gun violence, that was actually the year that uh, the United States reached its height of the total number of people incarcerated in the entire uh, 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 country. And it has um, come down some since, but that was definitely the uh, year that uh, really uh, uh, was the most incarcerative year in the in the history of the United States. That same year, Neil, was uh, the first time that the money that the federal government sets aside sets aside for victims uh, reached more than five billion dollars. So we've got five billion dollars being set aside by the federal government for victim services. We've got 
um, <clears throat> you know, the buildup of a criminal justice system that is now incarcerating more uh, people than the, than any country on on the planet by a, by a large margin, and still, you know, as Aswad said, he experienced what he experienced and received nothing in response. That what the justice system was capable of doing uh, was 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 little to nothing in terms of healing uh, that cycle of of trauma. And so one of the reasons I wanted to write the book was really to tell that story of what was going on politically versus what's actually needed to advance uh, real uh, safety. And, you know, what was going on politically was all of that, you know, sort of mass incarceration uh, policies that rolled out in the country from the 80s uh, and the 90s, um, really in some in some aspects to present day, um, has been sort of justified as what we need to do for victims, what we need to do f to improve safety. And, you know, that always, you know, our work at Alliance for Safety and Justice, you know, we're uh, organizing everyday people, we're in state houses across the country trying to change policy. And this myth that all of this mass incarceration was in the name of victims has stood out as one of the, the biggest barriers to real reform and also one of the biggest misunderstandings um, at the level of uh, voters and uh, decision makers. This idea that we're somehow protecting folks when we know through our work and through Aswad's leadership that most people hurt by crime and violence don't get help and experience significant uh, lifetime impacts in terms of in terms of trauma and the justice system responses only add to that to that trauma. Um, you know, there's been a, a lot of research. You know, you you asked about sort of what are the collateral impacts of trauma. Um, you know, we know a lot more about uh, the 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 life impacts of trauma uh, today than than we ever have, and it's it's really comprehensive. It's interruptible, but its impact is comprehensive in terms of significant uh, stress. Uh, difficulty sleeping, uh, depression. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, many people turn to substances to self-medicate. Um, you know, it, it, it destabilizes jobs. It destabilizes, uh, you know, your ability to care for your family, care for your children. Um, you know, the the generational impacts of of, of unhealed trauma are um, you know significant uh, in all aspects of of our of our lives. And you know, part of what I'm offering uh, in in the book is focusing on that would actually be a much better approach to public safety than um, you know building uh, all these prisons and and taf t passing all these tough laws. Uh, well, I, I I know that you had wrote down you said the, the the powerful myth that mass incarceration benefits victims obscures recognition of what most victims actually need including addressing their trauma, which is leading cause of subsequent violent crime. So like th that that's challenging, right? Because you're operating in a space in which there's this kind of myth. So you need to spend time trying to beat back that kind of narrative or that that myth and try and get people help at the same time. Like, how do you juggle those things? And and, and we know you've had success. And, and so I, I'm, I applaud and I'm grateful for all of your work. But I think some people, you know, don't understand that those two things have to happen at the same time you know how do you how do you manage those well i know aswad has some thoughts i'll, I'll you know I'll, i'm uh, i'll just throw out throw out a couple which is that you know i think it's really critical um for decision makers to listen to people who've been hurt people who have experienced a lack of safety can answer the question for you about what would improve public safety much better than criminal justice bureaucracies, much better than elected officials. And we've surveyed, our organization has surveyed 10,000 um, survivors of crime in the last decade. And um, there's some themes that really flip on its head this idea that all victims want is this tough incarceration. You know, that, that was the big mythology back in the back in the 80s and 90s was, you know, politicians could make entire careers looking like they were pro victim and, you know, and, and getting in front of the microphone and talking about three strikes and talking about truth and sentencing, talking about all these really tough things. 
But then it's like, okay, well, instead of listening to that politician, why don't we actually talk to people who've been uh, unsafe? In those 10,000 folks that we've talked to, which represent a diversity of opinions across the political spectrum and, you know, in terms of urban, rural, um, race, gender, you name it, what most survivors want is for what happened to them to never happen again and have a real clear vision on how to change that. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the vision is much more emphasis on prevention. We typically know what drives crime. This is not a big mystery. Um, you know, it's significant economic instability. It's unaddressed trauma. Um, it's uh, substance use uh, disorder. It's unaddressed uh, mental health needs. Um, these, are the, these are the things when combined where someone either gets hurt or hurts someone. And so if we really wanted to stop that cycle, we would focus much more. And that's what, um, you know, survivors have been have been telling us. Wow. Uh, that's a lot right there. I, I mean, because it's that there's this idea, you know, I think that in or, or, or the way I see it, at least, is there are certain communities that, you know, the first point of communication the first you know there's a that's a problem there's some a traumatic event the first line is is law enforcement right it almost forces this kind of retribution kind of tough on crime kind of thing as opposed to you know if included in that were, were conversations with 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 therapists who are in the community and and and, and, and talking about those issues those unaddressed issues in many cases that you were talking about so how, how, do, how do we do that? And how do you do that as well? And like in a practical level, you know, uh, how, how do you kind of get folks to listen, but then also, um, you know, unlearn some of the things that they might have learned? I, I think of myself, like, let me just say, like, I, I was in, in, in college at, at, at a long ago period uh, before the wheel. So I'm not even going to say the time period, but uh, it was a tough on crime moment. And there was this mythology that was fed to us that, you know, everybody who was a crime victim, you know, was kind of wealthy and white, right? White women. Um, and, and, and over time I learned that, 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 that's a mythology right there. Right. And, and that if, if you see things from that perspective, that then your policy prescriptions and your, 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 your practical next steps are actually going to be misinformed. So like, how do you bridge that gap between education and, and moving, uh, you know, to help people? Because I know that's all your, that's your, your all's heart. Yeah, you know, you know, crime survivors for safety and justice. We were founded by crime survivors, and we are an organization for uh, survivors. So, as part of our work at CSSJ, you know, we really focus on you know bringing together uh, those voices uh, of crime victims from those communities that are most harmed by the justice system, most harmed by violence. Those same communities are least supported by the justice system, are least supported. Uh, by victim uh, services. And so we focus a lot of our work on um, outreach uh, to those communities and to uh, those families, providing peer-to-peer -peer support, uh, referrals to uh, victim services, helping people understand and get access to victim compensation uh, programs. But also we do a lot of organizing and, and leadership development uh, and through training uh, crime survivors to turn their pain into power to heal uh, through action uh, by changing policies and laws. And at CSSJ, we primarily do like three things uh, that we do. Number one is really uh, focus on bringing uh, survivors together as part of a healing community, as part of supporting uh, each other, and as part of sharing uh, their stories. Uh, and as part of doing that, many survivors know that advocacy is part of the healing uh, journey for many survivors. We want to make change for our families. We want to make change in our community. So we also work on identifying policies uh, and laws that survivors are impacted by and develop proposals and legislation to help change uh, those laws. So for example, uh, in Florida uh, in 2019, we passed a HB 71 uh, 25 um, as part of that bill was changing the state's victims compensation uh, program uh, in Florida and, and, and consistent to many states across the country in order to be eligible for the victim compensation program in Florida back then you had to file a police report within 72 hours of a crime. So just think about that. You have to file a police report within 72 hours of being a victim of violent crime. Think about domestic violence survivors. Think about sexual assault uh, survivors. So once you meet that threshold, you only had a year to apply for the program. 
you know, we, you know, back in 2017, you know, I've traveled across the state of Florida, you know, from Miami uh, to Orlando, to Jacksonville, to Tallahassee, to, to Clearwater, to, 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 to Immokalee, talking with crime uh, victims about their experience. One, majority of crime victims have never heard of the victim compensation uh, program. And two, when they found out, and it was often through our meetings, our trainings, it was years after that they have been came a victim of violent crime. So that automatically excludes them from the victim compensation uh, program. So we work on uh, changing uh, uh, victim compensation laws. Uh, we did it in Florida. We did it in a half dozen uh, states across the country that increased access to a victim conversation for over 500,000 uh, survivors um, across uh, the country in those states. In addition to that, of, of, of listening to survivors and seeing the barriers in victim compensation, so we're working on changing those laws. We also, for many uh, survivors, especially survivors in communities of color, um, uh, uh, African American uh, women who are victims of domestic violence or sexual assault um, haven't been uh, protected and, and haven't had the services and resources that they need to heal. Um, and so part of our uh, work is providing housing and employment protections for all crime victims. Uh, in most states, similar to like Florida and, and, and Texas, there are laws for um, uh, domestic violence survivor to uh, break their lease, to, to move away from a residence that's no longer safe because of a, a crime happened in that household. Uh, but what about victims of, of, of gun violence where there's a shooting that happened uh, in the home. So we work on providing, um, you know, bills and, and from our member experience of, of, of providing opportunity for people to safely move from a home that's no longer uh, safe for them. We also heard from many survivors that families are often having to return back to work immediately um, after burying a loved one, um, going through that, that grieving uh, process. So our members said, hey, we need more employment protections uh, for survivors so that they're able to take the necessary time out to grieve, to navigate the justice system, to go get counseling, to go get uh, therapy without fear of losing uh, their employment. So we also work on uh, laws to provide employment uh, protections. And also, um, um, you know, one other kind of policy that we work on um, across uh, the country is that there is an infrastructure of victim services uh, in communities um, at all. I've traveled uh, this country. I've, I've, I've been in the households. I've been, um, you know, helping families, uh, you know, go get possessions of, of, of their loved ones who's no longer here together. And, and, and survivors are struggling um, in community. There's not a lot of victim services. There is an infrastructure for that in community. So what we work to do is, is build out on our trauma recovery uh, center model, which is kind of like a one-stop shop uh, community-based center that provides free counseling, uh, therapy, help survivors uh, uh, navigate uh, this new experience of being a victim of violent crime, help them apply for a victim compensation uh, program to help uh, them heal. So we're also working on building more trauma recovery centers uh, across the country. We started with one. Now we have over 44 uh, trauma recovery centers uh, across the country and, and, and growing um, every few months as well. Man, I got to tell you, like, I, I hear you, you you share that, right? And you're talking about 500,000 people who, you know, don't have to deal with this kind of bureaucratic um, nightmare right at the the, the, the peak of a, a traumatic moment or, or 44 communities that now have, you know, trauma services and centers uh, to help people you know in in their greatest need and so i mean i just applaud uh y'all for doing that uh it, it reminds me it's almost like and, and you're doing that while changing some of these narratives but also like living with them like the way i hear it is is like i think many folks are willing to be mad together but i don't know about putting in the time to heal together and so it like it impacts the ability i, I think uh, lenore you, you would you would use the phrase it leads to upside down priorities Right. So like I hear when you all are talking about, you know, what how, how we can help people who who have been victims of gun violence or, or, or face this kind of trauma. Right. It, it, it you, you see a pathway forward. And I think that's some of the challenge of kind of the, the, the old school tough on crime rhetoric is it doesn't really apply to the real people's lives and, 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 and focus on what it sounds like you hear constantly, you know, when you're talking to your membership, which is like we really want to take our experiences and stop 
future victims, you know, or, or, or those instances from happening through public policy. So how do you how do you continually try and like get the priorities in line? Like, can you can you give us some success stories or some conversations that you had where there were those breakthrough moments where suddenly, hey, there's a community that has a trauma center now because somebody the, the light switch went off with somebody. Well, there's so many stories. Um, you know, I think one of the things that's been so powerful about the work that um, we've been uh, designing ac across the country is, um, you know, this isn't this isn't theoretical, and it's not about politics either. Um, you know, this is honestly, it's about safety. And you know, when we bring, um, you know, a typical, um, you know. Uh, year for us is, uh, you know, we uh, bring uh, people who've been hurt by crime and violence together. You know, we load folks up on uh, buses and, and we travel to state capitals. And um, we when we go to those state capitals, uh, groups of survivors will then sit down and meet with legislators. And um, in those meetings, um, you know, w w the aha moments, I mean, it, you, you know, it would be impossible to count, count how many times we've literally had, you know, legislate, you know, meeting with legislators, constituency groups meeting with legislators, that's kind of classic, you know, in, a, in a, the American political system. And so usually it's like a legislative aide and maybe the legislator and they're looking down and they're kind of, you know, looking at their watch, they're, they're ready to kind of just, okay, okay. And they, and they assume it's like, okay, this is a, a crime victim group. They're going to tell me to get tougher and they're not going to understand that the, the prison system is expensive and they're going to not understand, you know, that, we're putting, you know, that we're releasing folks without, without support. And then, you know, the meeting starts and, you know, you, you, our members will say, you know, uh, we're here, um, you know, we represent, you know, 10,000 survivors of crime from your state. And we're here to say, don't build that prison in our name. Don't actually pass that crazy tough law. It's only going to waste more money. If you care about safety, what we need you to do is provide real help to victims and actually give people coming uh, out of the justice system a, a real chance to reintegrate. And it's like you could hear a pen drop in these rooms after our members describe their policy preferences. And inevitably, you know, whoever it is that's thinking they had a busy day stops and looks up and the meetings are always longer than anticipated. And the relationship is built from that point forward, right? Because what you're what you're doing is you're having kind of a breakthrough conversation on a on a on a decades old issue, and um, those meetings. I mean, we've built um, you know a, a nearly a dozen trauma recovery centers in Ohio, um, you know, eighteen in California, um, you know, uh, half a dozen in Illinois, very diverse states. Um, and whether it's a Republican elected official or a Democrat, it doesn't really matter because when they hear from survivors, don't do that yet again, that tired, old, you know, tough on crime thing, focus over here, it opens up an opportunity to look at the issue very different. Um, you know, one of the things, um, you know, that I, that I try and highlight in the book is just how, uh, just if we literally, like if we care about public safety, if we just helped victims recover, that alone would address a lot of our uh, cycle of trauma um, just, you know, just off of, of that, that one change. So, you know, we've passed legislation to um, expand uh, uh, earned credit opportunities for people in prison with the voices of victims at the center. Uh, we've passed uh, legislation to reduce um, incarceration for people convicted of a wide range of offenses, uh, you know, with voices of victims at the center. Um, those are examples of kind of what happens when we enter these conversations and make it not about politics and not about ideas. This is about real people saying um, what works. Yeah, and and there's depth in real people's lives, right? I mean, and and I, I love the story you tell about just kind of seeing that narrative change, right? Like a 20 year mythology just melting away provides an opportunity to to to, to do some something good to help people heal. And as you were talking about, if we simply focused on helping people who had been victims heal, 
uh, what a positive impact that would have. I think of the folks, you know, because obviously here at FRC, we've got chapters across the state. We we are advocates. We're 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 we're, we're, we're allies and partners with y'all. Love doing life together and trying to help uh, improve people's lives. Um, but I know that there are many people who are returning citizens who were victims uh, long before they ever made a decision to, you know, cross the other line. And and, and um, how do you? kind of meld that together because you're right like what, what we're also doing is to just not letting people just get checked for one box here you're having real conversations with people about real people's lives yeah i mean one of the the most harmful myths in politics is that you have bad people who have committed crimes mm-hmm. and you have innocent people who have only gotten hurt and never the twain shall meet and that sort of that myth of a of an extreme dichotomy uh, between the lives of people who have hurt others and the lives of people who have been hurt is one of the most harmful myths from the perspective of actually building good public policy. If we wanted to be honest, which the original Tough on Crime era and the uh, initial sort of tough justice victims' rights movement was not, um, we would start with that recognition. You know, there, it's like there's two concentric circles of like people who have committed crimes, people who have been victims of crimes. They overlap far more than they don't, right? They, there's just a narrow sliver on either side of people who have only hurt someone else or committed a crime or only been hurt. That's actually the exception, right? The, the vast majority of crime and violence happens between people who know each other. It happens through complicated relationships. And it happens in large part because when someone is hurt, there's not enough support. And so that unaddressed trauma becomes a contributor to later decisions uh, to get involved in crime. And you know, I should mention the data on this is global, right? This isn't a US phenomena. This isn't a particular state or city phenomena that you in any country in the world, when you look at who's uh, being hurt and who is uh, breaking the law, there's tremendous overlap in life experience. And so we have to ask ourselves, what are the life experiences that keep people unsafe, that prevent people from getting a pathway to real safety? Those life experiences, one of the core similarities between folks going into the justice system as uh, someone who's convicted versus as someone who's a victim, core life experienced, unaddressed trauma, Neil. And, and, and what's crazy is there is there was a an entire victims rights movement that could have gotten help to all victims of crime but based on race based on socioeconomic status we narrowly define victim just like you were talking about and missed the vast majority of people who are vulnerable never got real help and then ended up building a justice system that's better at incarcerating than providing support uh, as well uh, yeah and can I just Lord. say real quick, like, I know there's people watching right now who are just like, boom, right? Like, this is really powerful. And in that deeper work that we all do of how do we see each other? How do we interact with each other? Really has to start with understanding who we are, you know, and, 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 and listening to each other, right? I, I didn't mean to interrupt you as well, but. Uh, yeah, please, no, I mean, that, that's, that, that right there is what changed my life, Neil. Um, learning that during my last doctor's appointment of of getting the bullets removed out of my bag during surgery my doctor you know was, was began to tell me the story about the, you know this young man from my neighborhood who he had treated four years prior for a gunshot wound and i remember uh you know the more details uh, my doctor was sharing with me about that young man who was also from my neighborhood i, I began to realize he was describing the same young man that shot me That young man was shot at the age of 14 years old, just like myself. He was released from that same hospital back into that same community with no victim conversation, no victim services, no counseling or therapy to help him heal. Um, And and I strongly believe that played a huge role with me getting shot uh, years later. So just imagine if there was a trauma recovery center in my community at that time. That young man who started out as a victim would have received the support and services that he and his family uh, needed. Um, and, and, and I probably wouldn't have got shot. I would probably have been overseas 
uh, playing basketball. But unfortunately, there isn't victim services, isn't infrastructure. And so the cycle of violence continues in communities. And that's what we are trying to change. We hear the phrase hurt people, hurt people. We're bringing healed people together to help heal others. And we're doing that by building community, building the skills of survivors and training them to be advocates, to be leaders at the local and state level. And we're bringing our voices to uh, the state capital to make sure that our survivors are, are, are speaking across the country on what safety uh, looks like uh, to us. Oh, man, <clears throat> I got to tell you, you're just putting a human face on this cycle, man. Like, right, like where you can see this kind of trauma that doesn't get addressed, isn't looked at, that then plays itself out. And then lo and behold, here you are, man living, living his dream, ready to re get rolling, man, going to Europe, play some basketball, something you've been working for, and boom, the, the, this, this, this trauma plays itself out in a whole different place. And, and, and so any conversation on these issues without addressing the human condition and, and, and the trauma that somebody goes through and how that impacts public safety really isn't doing any of us a service. So, and, and, and yet what I love about y'all's work, right, is, is the ability to kind of touch and talk about the, 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 us as human beings, right, and, and our experience together, but also to see those points, right? Like you, 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 you zeroed in on this, this, this spot where it said, oh, you can only sign up for the victim compensation fund in 48 hours or a couple of days or a day, like you had mentioned. And who's going to do that when, when what you're really trying to deal with is the fact that your life has just been turned upside down and the ability to make a connection to make those kind of changes, I, I think just gives us all hope. Uh, are, are there some, some areas that you're really beginning to see now percolate in that same way where it's like, gosh, if we can do this and then we can scale it, we can really be, I mean, it's a 500,000 line. When you said that, man, I was like, I'm picturing faces and families and people living better lives, man. That's, that's, that's what it's all about. You know, um, Neil, the opportunities for, for hope right now are um, significant. And, you know, I just want to lay out a, a couple of uh, things that keep us motivated. Uh, one is, you know, what Aswad was describing in terms of our work to ensure that when people are hurt by crime and violence, they get real help in real time. Right. So we've won um, dozens of law changes to reduce bureaucratic red tape, to uh, reduce discrimination uh, in the applications um, and the application review process for people applying for uh, compensation so that we can get more people being hurt by crime and violence, real help in a shorter period of time to help them get on paths to stability as opposed to fall further into victimization debt, fall further into mm -hmm. the cycle of trauma. So that's one place where we've seen a lot of reform and we're so excited. The other place we've seen a lot of reform is uh, people's capacity to understand that being as tough as you possibly can with your criminal justice system is actually dangerous. It's actually extremely unsafe. If we really cared about public safety, we would emphasize trauma and healing for everyone, including people who are entering our justice system, um, you know, having empathy, building uh, uh, rehabilitation, restorative justice, uh, earned credit release, um, you know, shortened sentences, um, alternative sentences. We're winning those changes with survivors' voices. At the uh, in support and the third area I just want to lift up is you know really aligned with the the, the brilliant leadership of FRC which is uh, the second chances movement uh, you know this idea that we actually need to give people who have old records real opportunities to be a part of our communities um, those are policies that we have seen by a huge margin uh, victims of crime applaud and support. Um, you know, Neil, we just did a study of uh, victims of crime across the country um, just last September. It was our ninth study. Uh, and um, we specifically asked people who've been hurt by crime and violence, do you support policies that uh, provide a second chance for people who've served their time and completed their sentences? 90% yes. 90% of, of survivors support those policies. So this is really sort of the, the unlikely um, but strong ally in the movement for second chances are actually people who, um, uh, who have been hurt by crime and violence who, who, who want to see a, a real change in our overall approach to safety. 
Well, and I, I just got to say, I mean, it, it, our partnership with y'all is 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 um, is impacting lives here in Florida, all across the the, the country. Uh, so grateful for your leadership and and, and partnership. And uh, I'm hoping if people are listening, like they need to get your book, Lenore. And we're going to have all the information, make it easy for somebody to be able to get that. Um, I'm curious as 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 we kind of talk through these cycles, um, and I appreciate. I, I'm feeling hopeful, um, but I'm also curious about. How do we get law enforcement, right? Like we were talking before about kind of seeing people as their whole selves, right? And in and, and some cases, I think there are certain communities in which law enforcement has a propensity to see the, that community as, you know, some sort of suspect rather than a victim, you know, or some something like that. How do we continue to work with law enforcement so that they can see the the, the depth in the community and, and the need for healing, um, in addition to some of these other things that they might be, you know, bringing to the the, the, the whole conversation? And, and, and no, you know, it's a great question. And, and part of that is is building the relationships between law enforcement. And communities, but most importantly, building a relationship between law enforcement and survivors. You know, across the country, um, you know, so many stories of, of families who um, who lost a loved one. You know, um, just, you know, a higher percent of cases, you know, aren't being solved. Uh, so many uh, survivors and family uh, families do not have uh, communication. Um, you know, with the detectives working on uh, their case, so many survivors just feel neglected. Um, by law enforcement and the justice. So it's part of this building those uh, relationships in places like East St. Louis, uh, Illinois, uh, where we have our crime survivor safety and justice chapter. Uh, the police chiefs regularly attends our meetings uh, with survivors. So being able to listen to what survivors are going through, being able to uh, uh, share uh, information uh, with law enforcement as it relates to like their support and their needs is part of you know bridging that gap uh, between uh, families uh, and law enforcement, but also being able to, you know, identify what are some of those crime prevention solutions. And as Lenore talked about earlier, when you're able to provide victim services, you're able to provide healing, that is a form of crime uh, prevention um, in the community. So it starts with the relationship building uh, that needs uh, to happen. If you listen to survivors, we have the solutions. We know what our communities needs to heal. We know what our communities need to prevent uh, crime. Uh, but the failure is that we've invested, you know, billions of dollars into the justice system that's not keeping us uh, safe. You know, what if we invested, you know, billions of dollars into victim services um, and support? Uh, that's how we help communities uh, heal. And that's how we, you know, really build a uh, strong relationship between uh, victims, communities and, and law enforcement as well. I really appreciate you emphasizing the role of relationships and that, you know, hey, we're all individually in this together. Right. And, and mm -hmm. to know that there are people who can see that. Right. And that they can they can de develop a, a new understanding of the importance of healing and in, in trauma centers, um, even as the inertia of the system continues. Right. Like I think you had mentioned that there was five billion dollars for victims uh, compensation uh, within the United States. Do we do we know how much is actually spent? Is, is that actually, you know utilized or is that kind of uh like we see in many many instances is kind of that front end work but it doesn't necessarily make its way down to the community well we're changing that i um, knew I, I should have <laughs> preambled that entire thing <laughs> um you know a, a lot of what happened when victim compensation um you know so you know before the 1980s there were almost no laws in the books uh related to victims or victims rights and then from the 19 um you know 80s uh through to the present you know 32,000 laws have been passed 32,000 um so no no shortage of emphasis on laws being passed and money being moved the real question was, was any of that money actually getting uh, to the communities most harmed and least helped? And, and so we've been elevating uh, this gap between um, you know, money set aside for victims versus uh, which victims get help and which don't. And part of the reason we started doing these surveys across the country of survivors 
was to make that point that most victims have never heard of compensation and um, got, gotten access to any kind of help. Because of our work and, and the work of many other organizations looking to uh, support survivors, uh, we've started to see a lot of shifts. Uh, we've seen victim compensations laws change. We've seen more applications getting approved. Um, and we've also seen more creative uses of victim uh, compensation dollars. You know, this idea that someone is has to be you know, a, a, a legislator we worked with in California who read the victim compensation application, you know, before we reformed it, um, you know, he was like, look, even without being, uh, you know, traumatized by a horrific act of violence, it would take me months to fill this thing out, right? I'd have to be like <laughs> having my coffee and like, it's like going to college to, you know, to fill out this application. Well, you know, so he became, you know, a huge champion in, in reforming these things. And so we've been able to kind of simplify the process and move more of that money out the door. Government bureaucracies need transparency. And that's not just in terms of transparency on the Department of Correction side. We have to have transparency in our victim compensation policies mm -hmm. and rules as well. Every state usually has a victim compensation board. Every state gets Victim of Crime Act dollars. You know, voters and people hurt by crime and violence have a right to know where's that money going and is it getting in uh, where it needs to get in so that people can actually uh, get real help. And, and so we've been we've been slowly but surely changing it, but got a long way to go. Yeah, well, I appreciate what you're saying. And, and, and it is interesting. I think sometimes when we have these kind of conversations, it's, uh, you know, it's really important that we we point out the problem, but also know that there are solutions. Mm -hmm. um, one of y'all were talking uh, earlier, and I was thinking about actually working with your team in 2019 uh, when when uh, uh, you guys were working with the Judiciary Committee and implemented some of the reforms that uh, we just mentioned. And I, I'm, I was walking around around that same time period. We had a gentleman who had, uh, while he was incarcerated, he had been trained as a barber, right? And yet when he got out, he couldn't be a barber because he couldn't get the license. Right. And those were the, the, the kind of transformation and thinking that that I'm so grateful that you all are bringing in, into these conversations because there was no elected official. There's no policymaker that once you heard the basic facts and you talked to an individual who was like, look, I spent my time. I got a lot out of this. Being a barber he helped me heal. I became more social. I had some purpose and, 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 and it becomes real in those moments. And then, oh, by the way, once I was released, I'm not allowed to get a, a, a license in this state. And there there was no opposition, right? To your point, it's it's not politics in that moment. It isn't, you know, some zero sum, what's the red answer, what's the blue answer? It's kind of like, oh, we're fellow human beings here together. And so I just uh, applaud you uh, uh, in, in terms of kind of where, where you're going with this. And I'm curious, like, where do you see, you know, ASJ? Where do you see your leadership, uh, you know, in, 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 in upcoming years? <laughs> You're pointing, you know, uh, I, because I, I'm ever since we've we, we started partnering and, and your leadership around Amendment 4 uh, was so invaluable. Right. Like this this idea, right, that like from the outside looking in, people could say, how are these groups and different movements working together when actually it's like, no, 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 no. man, you got to dig deeper than that, that this is about people sharing their experiences together and coming up with common sense solutions to move forward. And if you're not willing to listen, right, like then we get stuck with these old narratives, um, which can be broken down one on one. Um, but what I'm, uh, you know, so hopeful about, especially with your book, Lenore, like I, I, I'm, I'm midway through, but you are a change agent and, 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 and a, in particular, a change agent in the head. Um, and I think the more people get get that and discard some of these old narratives, the better we're going to be. So I'm just curious where, where what's next? Where are, are y'all heading? So what's uh, in, in immediate next? Um, so this year um, in, in eight states that ASJ works in, we have our annual Survivor Speak uh, event uh, of bringing hundreds of survivors to uh, the state capitol to help advance some of the reforms uh, that we've talked about today uh, and also continue to build this movement. So we spent a lot of time talking about our crime survivors for safety and justice uh, work, which is our 80, 180,000 uh, member network. We also have our time done program, our 200,000 member network of, of people living with uh, past convictions. So we're bringing those two constituencies together with partners like you all to, to, to you know, to drive this plane uh, to uh, safety and, uh, and shared uh, safety as well. So we'll continue to grow 
our, our membership across uh, the country. So if you want to be a member of Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice, or you want to be a member of our Time Done uh, program, you can text the word member right now to one 888 458 0352 uh, uh, to become a member of CSSJ or uh, time done. We also need to, you know, really work on building infrastructure victim services uh, in the community. So we want to continue to build more trauma recovery uh, centers across uh, the country to help people heal and recover uh, from violence. Uh, we also want to ensure that we're advocating to bring those resources, those funding that we talked about to those local community-based um, organizations to help them build their capacity to help reach uh, the community uh, of survivors as well. So continue to um, you know, advocate for more funding for community organizations, continue to change policies uh, and laws uh, across uh, the country and, and ensuring that the people who are most impacted um, are at the center of public uh, uh, policy uh, making conversations. Lenore. And just the one other what's next I'll offer is really um, actually pretty immediate and uh, anyone listening can participate, which is I'm going to be in Florida and I'm very excited to be uh, coming out uh, to Florida the uh, last week of February and beginning of March. And I'm uh, super excited to, uh, to partner with our long term uh, partners and heroes at uh, FRRC. So we're going to be doing a book talk event together um, on February 28th and in Orlando, um, uh, March 1st in Miami and March 2nd in Tallahassee. So more details to come on that, um, but very excited to join the conversation and um, support uh, uh, our, our long-term uh, partnership with, uh, with you and Neil and, and Desmond. And um, it's just been, it's been uh, the opportunity of lifetime to do this work with you guys. Uh, well, we're well, back at you. And, and, and come on, y'all. Like, you, you heard it. Uh, Lenore is going to be here in, in Florida. And uh, we're going to we'll make sure that you get all the info uh, on, on, you know, bring your friends, bring your, your, your neighbors. Somebody needs to read this book. I'm telling you, it's going to change the way uh, people see uh, the, the work that we're doing and the lives that we're fighting for. And so we're just really excited for you to get out. And uh, it's going to be fun. Uh, in their names there you go look at that i like it lenore you are you you are one of my favorite leaders in this uh, across the nation and this important work, work we do it's good to see you hustling like that list i should have your book i'm the one who should be pointing this out <laughs> so let's hey, go um neil proceeds of the book go to alliance for safety and justice so i'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing what i always do which is which is hustle for hustle for the cause uh, well. um, yeah. <laughs> well, we're incredibly, incredibly grateful for that. I, I am. I'm as we are. We're wrapping up. We've just uh, we've just got a couple minutes uh, to go, I'm told. And, and I'm curious. Um, I, I, one, I just want to give a big shout out to uh, ASJ Florida uh, for the great work uh, here in the state, uh, continuing to build on the success in 2019. It, now, as we as we as we move forward and with some sealing expunge work and, and all these things that uh, fit into the, 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 the system changes that uh, we're all uh, working to, to, to change together. Uh, knowing that at the back end, uh, you name 500,000 people, that's just a number. That's 500,000 families. That's 500,000 communities uh, that are being impacted by this work. So you all, I am saying it again, you got to come out for the book event. It's going to be fun and it's going to be thought provoking and we're all going to learn something together. Uh, so with that being said, I'm going to turn it back to you guys. If you got anything, uh, any last few thoughts that you might have? Uh, I know you're a basketball player as well. Uh, my understanding is you're in Texas right now. So if we have to go Kyrie Luca, you know, we could debate that trade. But I, I, I think we're here for more important things than that. So uh, I will turn it over to y'all if you want to end, uh, end, end however you would like. Yeah, and I would just say, you know, um, you know, go out, go get in their names. You can purchase it on Amazon at your local uh, bookstore as well. It's just uh, it, Lenore is an incredible honor to be uh, featured uh, in this amazing uh, book. I just want to thank you for your leadership in criminal justice. Thank you for starting uh, this movement of survivors. And this is, you know, it's, it's an honor to uh, to be in leadership uh, under your leadership, uh, Lenore. And I'm excited uh, what ASJ uh, will be doing uh, years to come. But go out there and get in their names at your local bookstore or order it right now on Amazon as well. 
Excellent. Well, I can't think of it unless you have something else to add, Lenore. I can't think of a better way to end our conversation today. And I just want to say thank you again for all that you do. And and we know that uh, all across the nation, there's people's lives who are being made better by your work. So thanks, guys. Let my people-